area of recycling and, and we uh, uh, like put out a bid for somebody can run this transfer station and we make it easy for them to recycle newspapers into something usable. I like glass, for example, by oh, and then changing some of our code to um, optimize and um, make it easier to use some of these recycled. So I think glass is one of the, the good ones in that if we change some of our uh, construction code uh, specifications to require a certain percentage of crushed glass in the pipe bedding material, for example, when we're doing pipe insulation, sewer or water line around, that could use up virtually all the, the glass that we can crush up. All we gotta do is um, make a law, make sure the research justifies it so forth and all, do some experiment and all, and it might take, but it might take some investment from the county. But anyways, that's in a nutshell. One of the, the uh, missing, uh, pieces of that equation is the plastics is like what the heck do you do with these plastics you know and I did that was probably 10 years ago but I mean I did look into all this stuff and it seemed like it was hopeless between all the different types of plastics and the processes involved and safety issues that yeah this is not going to happen I just put it out of my mind you know so I'm be very interested to hear Dave uh, uh, Hear what he has to say and what's uh, what's the, the latest here. This could be a, could be a deal changer. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Tom. Yay! Uh, glad you can make it. Uh, we're doing tap happy dollars. Do you have uh, ten happy dollars for being able to make it in time for the speaker? Oh, he's leaving himself muted. He's on mute. Yeah, I should put myself on. Mute. We'll shake him down later. No, no, no. I hear. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sure. I, I'm whatever. Who do I pay and when? <laughs> <laughs> we can send you an online bill or put it, do what Doug's doing. He's, he's got his envelope and he's uh, just putting cash in that envelope each meeting. And then next time uh, he sees Zeta, he'll, he'll turn it in or the next meeting we have in okay. person. All right. I'm good for it. Somebody remind me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Got your mark down here. Thank you, Tom. All right. Yep. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce everyone again to David Marquis. Uh, he's our speaker today from Puna Precious Plastics. Uh, I know uh, we've all talked a lot about uh, what uh, his group is doing, and um, I will let him take it from here. Thank you so much for being here today, David. Thank you. Let me switch over. I got a PowerPoint here and I'm going to share my oh, screen. Okay, here. Let me make sure I have that enabled. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, think so. I think it is. Okay, here we go. There we go. Perfect. Here we go. Uh, I'm not a, a great speaker, so please uh, bear with me a little bit here. Um, I should tell everybody a little bit of the backstory because I think that's really important how this got started. Um, I started, I've been thinking about plastics for a few years now, quite a few years, and um, an opportunity happened. Uh, I had a, a injury, a car accident, and I wasn't able to work. And so, um, I was sitting on the couch thinking, you know, brainstorming ideas. What can I do to, you know, what kind of job can I do? And so I, I came up with 3D printing. And so I run probably the largest 3D printing farm here in Hawaii um, that's, that's all solar powered. Um, so uh, what I'm doing uh, with that is I, I, it's kind of, it's a little funny. I print toys for, for guys. Um, you know, models and stuff like that and ship those around the world. And so that got me, you know, since I was involved with plastic, that really um, was the, the key, you know, because I was buying these spools of plastic, you know, and they come from China and, you know, I just felt really bad because I got all these empty spools that are, you know, they're made out of ABS and must be like half a pound or something. And I, you know, I've gone through, probably a thousand spools, probably a lot. 
And so that kind of started my interest in plastics. And then when the county stopped, you know, announced that they're not going to recycle anymore because, you know, China and Malaysia stopped taking our plastic, that really spurred this, this idea that, hey, maybe I could take this plastic and turn it into 3D printer string or something like that kind of vague idea. Um, and so I, I, I kind of launched the idea, the Facebook group, and a group of, of highly motivated community members came to me and said, Dave, this is a great idea, but it's bigger than just you. It can't, you know, this is like, you know, this whole county issue and then the plastic, the world's plastic problem, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, was the impetus for everybody to come together and say, hey, well, this needs to be a community project. Uh, so then, you know, um, that kind of changed everything the way I was thinking about it. You know, I had seen uh, the precious plastic uh, project. It's They're based in the Netherlands. And basically what, what happened is they talked uh, a person, an like an investor or somebody, a philanthropist that had some money and gave Dave Hawkins basically a half a million dollars to, to develop an open source framework for people to recycle plastic around the world. Like in Jamaica, they have a 40 foot container right on the beach, you know, um, and they're just taking plastic, melting it down into other uh, objects that they sell. To make money so that's really where they uh really aimed precious plastic at you know so you know poor people around the world could go to the junkyard and find some motors and you know make it all work into some scary machine right um so that that really is the seed that said hey i could do this if they could do it in third world i could figure it out here in america and so, you know, I started investigating and doing a lot of reading and talking to a lot of people and watching, you know, Precious Plastic as they went through, I think it was like almost a two year long project where, you know, they had this money and Dave Hawkins said, okay, um, we need a lot of engineers. He's the president of the, of the project to figure out, you know, how, we, how can we do this in like the cheapest way possible. And so, uh, they offered, you know, how food and housing to any and everyone that was an engineer or somebody that could help the project move along. And they had like a hundred people from around the world flew into to the Netherlands and spent like a year living in a warehouse, you know, getting food and housing. You're not really making any money, but you know, you're doing something that you love, which is kind of cool. Um, so they developed the, the open source project, the, the machines, kind of, uh, you know, the designs. Anyone can take the design um, of their machines and just start building them today and selling them online. And there's quite a few people that are doing that. Uh, and so that's kind of like where I started. But as you know, the plastic problem is, is huge. And plastic itself is a wonderful material in that it's super resilient, it's hard, you know, it lasts forever. Um, and in that, that causes its own issue because recycling plastic is tough. It takes a lot of energy. Um, the precious plastic uh, grinder that I have, I don't know if anyone's seen it or not. I posted a video on the group of me using it, but you know, it's rather slow. It takes like like a milk jug probably takes, you know, a minute to grind up. And that's just not really feasible in a, you know, in like a, a high production sense. And so really, you know, where I need to get is like a big industrial, you know, grinder system. But uh, the challenge is funding because I don't have the money to get there. And then it's a power issue and all, you know, it's just kind of like all these different leapfrog issues. So, um, so where I'm at now, is I started out, I met a lady um, here in Pune. She manufactures medical uh, products, medical equipment, kind of under the radar. No one knows she's here, really. And it, it's kind of amazing, you know, the people you meet. She's, she's a wonderful lady, and, and she's making these uh, widgets out of her house by the billions. 
And so um, she felt really bad because her process produces plastic waste. She has a waste stream of like brand new fabric. You know, she, she cuts out whatever she needs and then the rest is scrap. And, uh, that scrap is nylon and HDPE, which lasts forever. And, uh, and uh, she's environmentally conscious and, and this was just kind of really hurting her, you know. And so she was looking for somebody or some way to recycle it. And that led her kind of to precious plastic and then, you know, through kind of online bumbling around, she, she ran into me. And so uh, she was very excited that somebody was actually doing this here on Hawaii, you know, within a decent range of her. And she committed to buying us a, a shredder. And uh, that was like 3,400, I think, for our first shredder, which I've been using. And it's kind of presented its own, its own issues, like I said, because it's, it's a power issue too, because I'm out here in, in Puna and I live off grid. And so I can't run the shredder on my, on my solar system. Um, and I had a small generator that wasn't really big enough to run the shredder at all. So, you know, then the search became looking for a, a bigger generator and, and she had one and I got that. And so it's just been this leapfrog process. Um, PPP, I, I designed it here. I set it up, uh, was to help people here on Hawaii Island, uh, to recycle the plastics, to stop throwing it into the landfill. We only have one landfill and, uh, you know, they closed the Hilo one, I believe, and now they're trucking all our trash over the mountain. Um, so you can imagine the energy waste of running, you know, a huge diesel truck up the saddle and then back. Um, and so the goal of the project was to, uh, the big vision, as I call it, where we would have like a big community center that would be a transfer station and a manufacturing facility as well. And maybe a classroom or two or something like that where we could, you know, educate people and people could actually see what's going on and, and you know, um, what we're doing with the plastic. Uh, Precious Plastic, I set it up. It's a Hawaii nonprofit. We're working on our nonprofit, uh, what's that, Philo C3-1 or something like that. Um, that's kind of been a big, a big hurdle to get that. Um, it's a lot of paperwork and, you know, I'm just kind of starting. And with COVID, you know, that kind of put everything on hold for like three, four months. Um, the products that I want to make, patio pavers. Um, I'm really close to actually producing a product. I've made six prototypes and a lady is using them in her shower, hopefully today. Um, they're 12 by 12 by inch and a half solid HDPE number two. They have an aggressive texture on the top, which is basically the flakes that have melted, partially melted down into the block. Um, so there's no other added uh, anything into the plastic. So it's a fully recyclable, re-recyclable product. So when you're done with it, you know, bring it back and you could chip it up and make something else out of it. Um, and that takes five pounds of plastic to make one paver, which is, which is 140 milk jug. Um, so that's a huge volume. You can imagine 140 milk jugs is probably, I don't know, probably three or four 55 gallon, um, bags of volume and it really you know it just shrinks right down because the it's really not a lot of plastic in a milk jug even though it's a a, a container and it's got a shape and all that so we can sequester a lot of plastic into those um, I'm also uh, wanting to build building blocks there's a, pl a precious plastic version I have it pictured here in blue um, and I have the machine to, to do it. I haven't gotten the mold yet. The mold, you know, it's kind of expensive as well. Uh, the mold molding for one, I think is about $700, $800, something like that, plus shipping to get it here. Um, so it's quite an investment just to get going. Um, I got the oven, all the stuff to make a big oven to make the pavers. I'm gonna make, I'm planning on making uh, 48, pavers at once in a in an oven. Uh, I also want to make boards or lumber uh, like here's a park bench somebody made in cells 
with lumber that's all made out of uh, recycled plastic. They use an extruded pipe uh, to give you the shape and then they use an extruder to pump it full of plastic and let it cool off and then you just pull it out and you have uh, a board that's really strong. Um, unfortunately, here on Zoom, I can't show you. I do have a sample board that I make made and it's indestructible. I mean, like the pavers, you could, you can't even break it. Um, versus like if you went to Home Depot and bought a patio paver, I usually break like five or six just trying to get them home um, because of the concrete, you know, it's not reinforced and they just break and that's, you know, wasted money. Where these plastic ones, you know, you could drive a semi over it and it, it's not gonna break. It's so tough, it's, it's crazy. Um, I also wanna make sheets of plastic um, so like, you know, a four by four sheet, um, there's been several artists that have approached me that really want to, uh, want me to make, make these, uh, building products or these other products for them so they could use in their artwork. Here's a picture of, a uh, if you can see it here on the screen of a building block wall sample that they built. I think, you know, these, uh, th these, uh, products can can address the plastic problem that we have and also the homeless problem. Um, I think it would be pretty awesome if we could make some, some, you know, shelters for people. And that was kind of the idea. I didn't put it on here. When I first started, one of the ideas I had for the nonprofit was that um, we would sell like the building blocks on a sliding scale or something, some such like that, where, you know, uh, where basically homeless people can get them free, you know, or something like that. Some way to give back to the community. That's really been my goal. Um, here's a kind of a picture of our July 11th collection that we did, our last collection. Uh, I filled a 20 foot rider truck to the ceiling, stuffed full twice with plastic, um, bags of plastic, which is probably about four times as much as we've ever collected. So it's just a growing, you know, as the word gets out, uh, people are more and more interested about saving the plastic from the landfill and bringing it to us. And we've set up collection, uh, worked with other like-minded individuals, community members across the island so they can set up a collection in their own community. Um, kind of like a starfish, I guess. I kind of was focused, really wanted to focus just on Puna, but these, you know, a lot of other people want to recycle as well. So I really couldn't say no. Um, so they, they hold their own collections um, across the island. There's one in Javi. Um, I'm setting one up and there's a lady in, in Volcano that's setting one up. Uh, I have a good opportunity for the Rotary Club or a group in Hilo, if they wanted to start a collection in Hilo, we don't have a, a collection there. And a lot of people are, are you know, just won't drive down to Puna, you know, even though it's just on the highway here where we run our collection. So I think, you know, if we could get a collection going in Hilo, that would be um, a great way to get more plastic from the landfill. I have an opportunity with a lady that owns a building uh, downtown that would be um, probably really good for a collection. It doesn't have power, but it is lockable or it is locked. So we could hold a collection in there, you know, get all the plastic in a, in a big pile. And then, you know, at closing time, just lock the door and walk away. And then I come back, you know, or somebody comes back a day later, or a couple days later to collect it. So that's one of the uh, opportunities I have. Another one, a big one that I part partnered with is the uh, PTA up at the Army Training Grounds. Um, I met, <clears throat> I'm in, uh, I'm coordinating with the recycling manager there to recycle these plastic shipping tubes. They're brand new. Uh, they probably weigh about four pounds each and the government just, you know, when they're done with them, they just landfill, go right into the landfill. And it's like virgin material, you know, about a quarter inch thick. It's a lot. I, I think each each one of these tan tubes can make one paver um, approximately. So I went up there before, uh, this must have been in January, I believe. 
before COVID and I, I got 3,100 pounds of plastic in a rider truck and then brought it back here. <clears throat> and I'm working on, on uh, chipping it right now. Um, that's kind of one of the, like I said, uh, one of the, the hurdles that I've faced is just, you know, getting a machine, this plastic, when I first got it, it's not, it's too thick to run through the plastic, uh, the precious plastic shredder. Um, so I was kind of at a standstill. I got another machine uh, just recently. Uh, it's a big wood chipper. It's a 12 horse wood chipper. And what I've done is I take these strips or <clears throat> these tubes and I cut them and then I cut them into strips and then uh, then I could feed them into the wood chipper, which really uh, will chip, it chips pretty fast to the strips. So it makes short work. It's probably about 10 times as fast as the, the other chipper, maybe even faster. Um, so that's been a real bonus. Uh, some of the challenges that we have, all, uh, funding, you know, that covers the machinery, uh, you know, I don't have, I want to get a bigger wood chipper. Like if I could get one that is either uh, a PTO driven wood chipper that we could uh, hook up to an engine or maybe a trailer mounted one that's got an engine already ready to, you know, it's already one unit. That would be probably my next big step. I got to get to a point where I could just throw, um, you know, any container in there within reason and that it'll shred it. Um, that's not the case right now. Uh, with the uh, the precious plastic shredder, I got to chop everything down, even the milk jugs, into probably three pieces, and then you know feed it because it jams. Um, where the chipper I got now, it'll eat a whole milk jug uh, on its own without any other processing, but it won't. The like the bleach Clorox bleach bottles are probably a little too much, so those need to be cut in half. Um, and to do that, you know, it's, it takes time and, and I use a bandsaw or another saw to do that. Uh, building space has been a challenge, of course. Uh, right now I have rented a, a 20 foot uh, container that I'm storing stuff into and uh, also working out of. Uh, and employees for funding, you know, uh, currently you know, uh, haven't made anything. It's just a, a donation, goodwill type thing. I'm not even, you know, I'm not paying myself at all. That's kind of the, one of the big things with plastic. It's so hard to, to recycle. It takes, you know, it's a big challenge. And labor, that's probably the biggest thing. Labor um, is the downfall to any business that is trying to recycle on a for-profit basis. Um, because, you know, you could spend an hour just trying to clean one jug and I got a million of them, you know. Um, so you really, you couldn't, you can't just pay people to do that. I mean, that just won't work in that kind of sense. But what could work is if we could find a way to get funding through the county or work with the county, but that's got its own challenges. I've worked with uh, our local county council member, um, Matt Kleinfelder, he's been indispensable. Um, just spent hours on the phone with me, just navigating what, you know, what the challenges are, what those permitting is like, um, and, and those kind of issues. And, and it's gonna be uh, kind of an uphill battle and uh, really focused on changing the laws. The way it is set up right now, um, to even apply for a permit, I have to have a manufacturing facility set up, just waiting. And then I could apply, you know, submit a $5,000 application, non-refundable, you know, and hope they approve it sometime while you're sitting on a huge manufacturing facility that's not making any money um, or paying for itself. Uh, so that's, that's another challenge that we have. Um, Zoning is an issue as well, because here on the east side of the island, there's only one place that I could set up a, a, a permitted recycling facility, and that's in Shipman Park. Um, 
and that's going to be expensive too. You know, commercial property is is insane. Just uh, the price and power. Power is kind of a, a big thing with uh, thermal plastic. Um, <clears throat> like when I make a paver and like a I used a conventional oven where I just heated up to 350. We're not, I'm not burning it. It doesn't smoke. It doesn't smell at all, except maybe the rotten milk that somebody didn't wash out. Um, and you just heat it up, but it takes a while, like an hour, to heat up all that plastic and it, and it just kind of slowly turns into putty. And then you bring it out when you're done. Either you put pressure on it to, to uh, close any voids or like on the paver, it's just an open top mold. It just melts and then you pull it out and you let it cool. But it takes like six hours for it to actually cool down enough that you can actually handle it. Um, it just, it's that chemical process of those bonds as they unstring and then restring that just holds so much energy. So, um, you know, one of the challenges that I've had is how, how can you melt or make a product and enough a quantity that um, you know is doable. The pavers I'm going to sell probably for five or six dollars. Um, you know, so you can't spend like three hours messing around and making one. You know, I got to make like a bunch at once to make it to make it uh, reasonable. And to do that, we were thinking about different kinds of you know what can I use to do that. A uh, good idea we came up with was a pizza oven, and we started looking around at pizza ovens. And it was like, you know, insane amount of power, three phase that they don't have, you know, I can't get three phase down here. I have a three phase generator, but it's not big enough at all to run a pizza oven, electric one. And then, I, you know, we just kind of brainstormed up an idea that, hey, why don't we find like a propane one? Because that would, you know, solve an electricity problem. And that led me down to the road to build my own oven. And, uh, Alan Okinaka. Yes. See here. So I'm sorry I rambled on about a lot of different stuff. Um, let me answer your questions. What questions do, do you guys have? Um, David, have I have, you, have you tried? Checking with research and development for grants funding to do further research or analysis on the business model. Uh, yeah, and um, depending on who you who we're talking to, as far as grants, um, the problem with grants is it takes a long time to actually um, obtain them, and we're not quite there yet as far as a lot of. The grants have like time, they want to see your business like in business for like two years or something like that, plus you follow C3, you know, sort of. So that's really been a challenge. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I've looked into it and, you know, I, I'm, I would be super interested in applying if I could. Uh, can I chime in? I have sort of a whole long list of, uh, I'll wait till everybody else gets out of the way, but the sort of addresses, <laughs> well, Doug is laughing already. <laughs> uh, a few things. Um, yeah. First, I just, a a first, just a broad comment that uh, I think you're thinking too small. Um, if this actually works, if some of this stuff you're talking about works out in an economical way, you're not going to have any problem with financing here. Um, and part of that thing may be uh, also related to is, uh, and I jumped down my list here, but any license or patents involved, you know, you're not the first person to be thinking of this kind of stuff. And um, you got to be careful about um, interfering with somebody else's patent because there's if this is actually a feasible thing, which you seem to be promoting, then I bet you there's hundreds of people already working on that across the, and people with money to spend, not, you know, trying to right. arrange for a, you know, a portable chipper or whatever. Um, but that's just the one thing, if it's gonna work, so we gotta establish the feasibility of it first, then, I, then you can really step forward. 
With that being said, one thing I didn't hear you talk about, now I'll go to my regular list. Um, plastic, there's all types of plastics. Um, you're talking about the number two HDPE here, uh, which should be pretty straightforward, I think, but there's, um, you know, there's all, there's other, I'm not an expert in this, but I know there's a handful of other types of commonly used plastics that cannot be mixed. You mix them up with your batch of HDPE or you got a problem, you got, you know. So somehow in your whole collection, sorting, processing uh, routine, you got to have a good source separation. So, you know, and ideally, okay, you have five different types of plastic. You got five different paths here, trains them to go on. Um, I love this. Was that somebody trying to? Um, I love this one you have here with the HDPE. It's a simple process of uh, lightly melting it and then using it. I wouldn't worry. I would stay away from building materials. I could talk about blocks and all, because you need to get federal national approval for those to be used in approved buildings. So our county building division is not going to accept these as a building material unless you receive national approval. Now that you talk about time, you're, you're really talking about time then. Yeah. So, but you have a, almost an unlimited supply, just those pavers you talked about. If all you did was limit yourself to those pavers, I think you'd have more market than you could know what to do with, especially if right. the county, like I mentioned earlier, the county adopted certain uh, policies that would um, give you a little more advantage in the, in the market. Um, there already, I'm sure you know, there's already an ex uh, existing um, uh, sections of the state uh, law, I guess, that uh, allows for local purchases. So if you get your name on a, a list of local purchases, it gives you a distinct, I think it's about 10%, as long as you're within 10% of the other uh, suppliers, you, the contractor has a duty to purchase the, the locally produced one. Do you find out, so I think more about, like you say, the picnic tables, all kind of park benches. Think about things that government can use all over and they specify, you're in, you got, you sell all the park benches, you know, there's loads of them all over. Um, parking, little right. stop, wheel stops. There's just those things that could be marketed to uh, government agencies, ideally, I think is where you should probably be focusing your your aim on. And then those other plastics, how are you going to separate them in a, in a readily without one person there, pull them out. You're going to have to automate this thing too, somehow. Um, yeah, that's uh, what we're, you. Uh, you know, let, yeah, let me uh, just absorb that them. and comment on those of you on. I got a couple let me, more. Let me, let me comment on your, on your questions are there. And, you know, right now, uh, yeah, totally. You can't mix, you know, different kinds of plastics. They're, you know, their own kind of chemical makeup. So what I'm doing is on our collections, uh, we have come and, and bring their pre-sorted plastics and then just drop them in a in the trash. And they're pretty good about you know, getting it right most of the time. Most, you know, and then in my processing, since I'm just a single person, what I do is I dump the bags out on a big table. And then uh, if it's still got a label on it, I don't mess with it. It goes right into another bag to be dealt with later. Um, and then, you know, I just pull out everything that's delabeled, check and make sure it's a number two if I don't already know. And then it goes into another bag that uh, then goes into the shredder. Um, so that's my process. Uh, the pavers, you know, it's just a generic product that, you know, everyone makes them and they're not really, it's not really a patented, you can't really patent it unless you made it your own product somehow or something like that. You know what I mean? Oh, Peter, you're on a mute there. You got to believe they're going to be coming up with patents that you violated and, right. and blah, blah, blah. Doug can probably speak to a lot of this better than I and Tom for that matter. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's one of the areas I need help with because I'm just one guy trying to do it all. And I, you know, we all have our little niches where we're good at something and not good at others. And that's kind of, you know, chasing all the paperwork is really hard. 
doing all that. So somehow so. as you think about moving up, right now it's like an experiment sort of process confirmation trying to define that you do have something that works, little home experimentation. But as you try to move up into actually commercialization, you, that whole sorting thing is going to have to be addressed somehow oh, very quickly. Oh, totally, Peter. Uh, we're way past the experiment uh, stage here. Mm -hmm. I've committed to tons of plastic sitting here right now. Tons. Yeah. Then the other uh, thing kind of that goes with that also is uh, safety issues. Now you got people working there converting uh, plastics. You're uh, you're in a in a whole regulatory. You came into a new world. If you're not, you probably are got exposed to some of it. Right. But uh, look out, boy. Um, that's a serious thing. Oh, not yeah. only uh, you know. for the regulatory issues and the, 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 the just the mm -hmm. day to day stuff you have to go through, but literally the safety of the employees is a significant concern. I mean, real uh, like legitimately. Oh, that's paramount. Oh, yeah. oh, totally. You know, and that is a big, a big concern on on my head too. You know, and kind of how I've thought about it is that, you know, we have a lot of issues, all these different issues, right? But the the truth is, we can't just. We got to figure out. You know, if we give up, we die. Oh, nobody's plastic. saying give up. I'm just pointing yeah. out some of the areas that yeah. probably going to need no, a little no, no. more. No, no, I'm just like brainstorming, you know, that's how I see it, that we can't give up. There's an answer out there. We have the U of M here. We got all those brainiacs up there. I love it, you know? I love it. Yeah. That's, you know, well, we yeah. need to start using local resources and figure out a way because, you know, we're just shipping in plastic. If you just look at it from a Hawaii standpoint, all this stuff just comes in like a landfill. It stays. It's not leaving Hawaii. Um and it's a lot of plastic. It is so much. It's on, you know, you can't really wrap your mind around it. It's, it's so much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working with a guy, uh, an artist. His name is Don Elwing. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a, uh, he's a, a marine debris artist. So he takes marine plastic and then turns it into art. He's kind of like international. And He's just like a weird, you know, he's just one guy, but he lives down in Ocean View. And, you know, you wouldn't know unless you know him, maybe. But he show, he's done some shows at the, uh, what's that, the Tsunami Museum or up here. He's had some art shows around. But the interesting thing is he goes out to the beach and then, you know, collects all this plastic and then does his art. Um, and so where I was going is I, I'm going down this weekend to, to pick up a piece of his artwork and one of his ideas that he just kind of threw out on the wall was hey wouldn't it be cool if you could actually have a shredder on a trailer self-powered with a generator or whatever that you could pull down onto the beach and then you could have like a beach cleanup day where we take and you know melt you know, chip all you that gotta stuff be able down. to sort those quickly you gotta be able to sort through every well, piece of plastic quickly not necessarily because there's another process we could use called it's called what Pyoresis, it's a, it's a Latin word. They're doing it in California where they take all their plastic and they stick it into like a big tube, metal tube and close it and in a vacuum or, you know, there's after it starts heating it up, it, all the oxygen disappears, but in an oxygen less environment, they heat it up to like 1100 degrees and it turns it back into oil that they sell back on the market. Or they use it to actually part of it to to power the plant too. Um, so that kind of, I'm not super sold on the idea because yeah, I'd be very careful. Kinda, Again, you're melting all those plastics together, and you and there's all kind of weird chemical stuff going on. I think right. you got to well, segregate them. I mean, that's well, we have uh, limited knowledge. We've got a little bit of time left. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask questions. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's why I tried to get everybody out of the way. I knew I was No, gonna... it's okay. I, I know you're, you're passionate about this, and I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, well, you've got a lot of background in this. So. We can meet together uh, separately. Let me, show Let me just toss question. in a couple of questions from, from this side. Um, I, I mean, I, Peter's going to get his consulting fee, I know. So um, I'm out of the business. Yeah. The, it, it sounds like you have plenty of product or plenty of supply, but if um, if folks wanted to provide 
how do, how is that part of your system? It's not just, it's the, it's the gathering, right? How do, how do you, you have a system set up for the gathering of the, your plastic supply? Yes. Let me, let me show you, uh, let me share my screen again here. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, have you guys been out onto, um, the Facebook group? The what? Have you guys uh, had a chance to go out and see our, the Facebook group for uh, Puna Precious Plastics? We have about 3,000 members here from Hawaii in this group. And like here is a, a, a graphic of our last or our next drop off. So uh, we asked people to come on August 8th between two and four we have some COVID uh, protocols that, you know, it's gotta be pre-sorted and you gotta have a mask and that kind of thing. And so people show up and it's just like a buffet where you got your bag of number twos and you walk through the line and there's the sack for number twos and you just dump them in. Um, and we have volunteers there to, to make sure, you know, that it's getting in the right bag most of the time and that it's clean and, and uh, acceptable and not, you know, what I call wishful recycling. Right, and so right now you have plenty of, of supply, it sounds like. So you, you've got a collection yes. mode, primarily East Hawaii it looks like, maybe a little bit of Upper Puna and maybe Ka'u as well, but mostly East Side. Right. And then um, you're developing the products that you're making, you know, because you're combining this with your 3D printing capability. Um, do you have a take are you taking any orders from anybody in terms of creating uh, the stuff or are you just you know making um you know like henry ford did model a's and as long as they like black you know they can get any one any one they want kind of uh, thing. i haven't taken pre-orders yet because i i need to get the oven built and be able to you know actually make them right That's one of and the, then on the power the i was just just a thought on the power um piece of this um and, and I think Tom would probably be uh, the other person to, to chat about this. The, um, you know, you've got uh, PGV that's right there and, and they're, they've got their contract, of course, with um, Helco, uh, but that doesn't mean that they're using everything that they're doing and they may be able, you, that might be a source potentially of renewable energy as well. Um, it might be actually, um, D depending on your storage cap your battery uh, capability from solar solar on the east side is not as good as it is on the west side obviously and so having a um ha having a source of power that would be capable there um and then you know if you end up making too much power then you're going to be a classified as utility and, and have to work with the puc as well so uh just a couple of um comments regarding the power side of things Thank you. Uh, and yes, you know, um, I've talked to this this lady, Wendy, that is a good backer of ours. And she's got a, a good solar system. It's just the price because it's like a sixty thousand dollar system. But if I got that, I could I could run three phase solar power here. Um, so I think it, you know, it's just a matter of getting there is is the challenge. Um, but I agree with you. We should, you know check all options if we can, you know. Uh. I was going to mention the uh, PGV also. I think that's a, a great option. It may be the most logical. There may be direct heat, not even going through the electrical stage there, mm -hmm. and heat exchangers and other just their process uh, heat that they uh, disperse, um, especially if they were part of the company, whatever the initial company that the, uh, um, mm -hmm commercializes this, this technology, uh, maybe they would be a good one to bring on board to uh, right. give them an incentive to incorporate this into the, um, mm -hmm. their whole industrial operation. You know, one of the believe. ideas that I had that I didn't talk about is uh, fence posts. There's a company in New Zealand that I would like to copy that is making six inch, you know, fence posts out of you know HCPE and they're about 50 pounds each you know they're it's like a solid thing 
and it's all automated and they run this huge factory with like 10 people you know that's um, what i envision yeah you know from from store to grinding to everything and you know it's all automated and that's kind of an idea i'd like to get to or would be a good product especially here in puna you know everything rots so we David, I apologize for having to step away. I had a really important phone call to grab, and um, so I, I didn't catch uh, much of your beginning part. But you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and I don't know if you covered it, is um, uh, for a long time we were shipping all our one, two, and five plastics to China, and uh, about a year ago, I guess uh, they said we don't want your dirty plastic anymore, so we had, we stopped that. Uh, what what is the chinese doing in a mass scale i mean what are they doing with all that plastic it, it, or and is that something that we could um we could ad adopt uh, and apparently they they were taking a lot of plastic from the usa so what is what what are they doing that um that uh, made them uh, m make it feasible for them to collect plastic all the way over the ocean well, it really wasn't, Alan, to be honest with you. They were doing it kind of to appease America, um, you know, to make, to make nice. In reality, probably only 5% of all that plastic that we shipped over there was actually recycled. The rest of it was thrown into the earth, you know, or into the ocean um, because it was all contaminated. You know, dirty plastic is not recyclable you can't you know that's that's one of the challenges with plastic is you can't take a bottle that has you know food waste or any kind of oil left in it and then you know grind it up and then use it because those contaminants you know uh you know cause problems in the machines and make the plastic not stick together like the labels are usually like a different uh kind of plastic so that's when you're dealing with the recycling and melting recycled plastic a lot of the off-gassing and the you know the burning and stuff that is a problem comes from those contamin contaminants from the labels and from the glue and stuff that's left inside so that's been a challenge for us to you know i we've you could remove the labels by hand a lot of people you know you have to use solid oil and that's really slow that's not like an industrial type thing and a lot of people do do that you could cut them off as well which I, that's what i do here on the milk jugs, if you know, on all the labels that I get, I just use a razor knife and just cut around it, and it's you know a second and you're done. Um, but that is that is a big challenge. I wanted to show this to the group too. This would be an awesome uh, machine for somebody to buy. This is a, a direct educational machine where you take this to the to the classroom and the kids take all their chip wrappers and all their saran wrap and whatever they got, you stuff it full of plastic, like I was saying, screw the top on and you turn it on and it runs on 110 and it turns that plastic back into oil over here, um, like a, a distillation process. And you can see it's, it's harmless. It doesn't give off any bad gas or anything like that. Um, here's a picture of the kids doing it. I think this would be like an awesome thing if I could buy it or somebody could buy it and just go around and have an educational part of PPP. That was kind of one of the things I wanted to do too, is try to educate people about plastic. Um, one of the challenges with plastic is when people don't understand it, it becomes magic. And if it's magic, people, it's scary and they don't understand it and all, you know, that's been a challenge too. Um, but I think through this, we could educate, you could educate kids and other people. And this is developed for recycling your polypropylene, your styrofoams, your PE, which is HDPE, that kind of thing. Who's using this machine? Uh, this is developed in Japan. There's probably about a hundred companies that make the same product. It's not, you know, they might have patented their way of doing it, but the the, the process itself is not patentable. 
And what it is, is it just heats up a sealed container up to like 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that plastic, instead of burning, breaks back down into oil. And so you're left over with oil over here that is like kerosene oil and diesel. And it's actually pretty valuable. They send, uh, the company I was saying mentioned earlier, I think back in November shipped their first tanker car full of oil or, you know, semi truck full of oil. It, it was on the news. Um, I have a, an article somewhere. But they used a machine like this. This is just like for demonstrations. This wouldn't be like, you know, for like a production. Um, so that's that's kind of one of the ideas I, I have. I think this, this kind of machine runs about $4,000, something like that. Uh, there's other people that, you know, have made their own type of, you know, machine to do the same thing. You know, it focus on making a system that works first, and then yeah, after you capitalize and have a whole going thing, then you can go around sharing it with the youth and all, but then you got to focus on getting something that works first. Right. Hi, I want to jump in here real quick because it looks like it's 1259. Um, first of all, I want to say this is awesome. One of my top favorite presentations. It, it's a, a ugly, guilty feeling to go to any dump and recycling center on the Big Island right now and just be throwing away materials that could be used to better our lives instead of, you know, destroy it. Um, so thank you. Thank you for using your time and your energy to, to create solutions. And I, I think you're on a, a really powerful path. Um, I was looking at your obstacles, the labor, the funding, the location, the power. Um, definitely all solvable, not to be overly optimistic here, but like, yes, name the obstacles so that you can work around them. Um, and then this is kind of like a really minor little question, but is there a way that um, plastics can be sterilized at a location, for example, I, I remember these big um, dishwashers that are mostly just like hot water and steam and you load up the tray in there and it shoots the hot water steam it, for a period of time and then the dishes come out and they're clean, they're sanitized, nothing rubbed them, you know? And so I'm kind of thinking like, at what temperature um, and duration would the labels and the glue adhesive and any additional uh, internal residue D disintegrate, evaporate, fall off, schlep off, get collected in the basin of some kind of system. Uh, because one of the challenges, sorry to be talking so much, is that in, in our American culture, you know, people you can always rely on them to do something so simple as rinse out your recycling before you put it in your car. And I, when I go to the dump back when we were collecting plastics, the guy sitting there was like, we're all going to throw it away because half y'all aren't rinsing them out anyway. So it's, you know, so I'm trying to think like, you know, um, if the location near shipment is a viable opportunity, if that, you know, because you'd have the power supply and the space and the zoning, um, if there are contracts available to, to get that set up for you so that you have a model in place so that uh, employees could be funded, is there a washing scenario that could be built into the process? So schools, for example, could, you know, once a week drop off their collection to the site and people could put it in the vat, sterilize it, and then, it, you know, that way your product isn't um, destroyed before you get the opportunity to revitalize it. Thank you. Right. That's a great idea. You know, I've thought about using steam just to melt the plastic. I haven't thought about, you know, using it to clean the, actually clean or take labels off. So that, that's a great idea. And then how would we get to learn more? I mean, so just joining your Facebook page or do you have um, other opportunities to brainstorm and learn about how we can support this because the island needs a solution and yeah, and you're, you're working on it already. So how can, how can our club support you and how can we um, as individuals who are interested reach out to you and, and develop conversation and opportunity? Well, I'm, uh, we have opportunities on our, on our nonprofit board. Uh, I have multiple seats that are open. I have lots of uh, volunteer opportunities. Uh, just there's so much, you know, so many things to do that I just can't do them all, you know, like a fundraise manager, uh, all, you know, all these different people to manage all the different aspects. A lot. So at least so I can focus more on, on, on dealing with the plastic and not, you know, talking to people on Facebook all day, <laughs> you know, trying to get some help. 
uh, that you know, just volunteering. If you want to be on the uh, be on the board, come to the meetings. Uh, you know, help uh, run a, run a, a a collection. Help with the collections. There, there's just so many ways to to help. You know, uh, there's you know non physical ways to help. Just being on the computer and talking to people. Being like, uh, you know, one of the big problems I have is. Just being one person, I don't have a secretary yet. So I, I get the phone, I can't even touch my phone if I want to get anything done because people are calling, texting, um, those kinds of things. You know, it's really exciting and 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 people get really fired up and about it, you know. So, and that's really what we need. We need, um, right now I'm trying to trying to fight the, the wishful, what I call wishful recycling. Um, where people really feel bad, and I, and I do too, about buying something that's plastic. And so, even though you, it, it might not be recyclable in reality, you feel like you want to recycle it anyway. So you throw it in the, in the, in the bin. And what that does is it just causes more work, you know, because then you got to sort it out, throw it out. Like um, somebody said about the contaminated dumpsters, that's very true. And we spent many hours talking about how could we. As a as a company and a nonprofit contract with the county, because we've already talked to the county about all these things, um, you know, how could you be, uh, uh, how could we provide the service for the county, you know, like like business services did, you know, where they just drop off a dumpster and people are throwing their tires in there, and then, you know, we couldn't, you can't really, you know, we couldn't do that, and so that's why we've kind of shied away. The reality of doing it is we would have to employ somebody that would be like a watchdog, a watchdog, you know, that come and you dump out your stuff, look it at it, okay, it looks good, shove it into the container or whatever kind of a situation, which I, I don't think that's bad, that, that we could create jobs for a lot of people here, and that was kind of one of my aspects of, you know, provide jobs for people, not just myself, because, you know, it's just the crushing desperation here in Buna, really. And so that's one of the things I wanted to solve with, with the, the effort. If I can ask, we touched on it earlier, but do you have the, uh, at least the theory or processes for separating these? Like is one, uh, type one is heavier yeah. so that you can float it and move off this way and type four has, that has this, so therefore you can do some other process to yeah. separate. I, I don't think you're gonna manually separate everything. I don't think it's going to well, work. Right now, I'm, so I'm sorry, just be, before you continue, Dave, um, our meetings uh, end at one o'clock and we're now at 105. Uh, if, do you have time to stick around for some more questions for anyone who wants to stay on? I, I certainly do. Okay, wonderful. So um, at this time, uh, I'd like to adjourn, formally adjourn our meeting, but you're welcome to stay on if you have uh, more questions or if you'd like to uh, stay on and, and learn more. So uh, I will take us through the four-way test of things we think, do, or say. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendship? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, have fun. And with that, meeting is now adjourned. Please stay on um, and for, for more Q&A, um, we will record this if you want to come back to it. I, I'm going to get it up on YouTube at some point. Um, but yeah, thank you all for, for joining us. And thank you all who will stay on. So um, please, David, if you want to answer Peter's question, I just had to get that out of the way. Yep. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Well, I just asked if there's a... the. Big, one of the main hookup uh, hangups on this whole thing is steps in the process is how you're going to separate out. If you're going to focus on number two, so it seems to be the simplest one to actually make products out of. How do you separate automatically all the other plastics out in a reliable, mm -hmm. relatively labor free, it's got to be an automated type of system? Is there different weights, yeah. a unit weight, or whatever characteristics that um, allow you to? optimize and use that to in order to separate right there there is and and uh they have a machine that will actually identify the the plastic for you it's got a little scanner you just hold it up and it goes beep and tells you you know what it is other than that what we've been you know i want to get one of those but 
and that's piece kind of, by know, piece. I don't think that's going to be economically viable either. If it's well, one every milk well, carton, you got to go and test with a well, one by one. I don't know if that's going to. Well, that's that's not the idea. You run it over a conveyor belt, and each piece runs all across it, and then you know you'd have to sort it that way. It wouldn't be like a manual. Well, they could identify. They could have a, some sort of scanner and. Yeah, that's a, if it takes, you've got to take a little sample or somehow analyze the chemical properties and then, okay, this is a, this, I don't know if right. that's going to work. But, you know, that's, it's just, it comes down to money. The, the entry level machine that I would buy is like $1,500. They have like a $6,000 handheld gun, but, you know, it's like a radar gun, you just beep, but, you know, it, it comes down to down to money right now. That's 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 the biggest challenge. You know, where do you get the you know getting the funding to get you know so. You know, if, you can, of, if you prove the 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 concept, the money is not going to be an issue. Six thousand dollars is not is yeah. not is nothing. Well, I, I could tell you, sixty thousand would be nothing. I could, I could prove it, but you know, getting a loan, I'm not going to take a loan out. So. That's the, See, that's, that's the way you're saying. Just a beep on each one, and it's going to say that's a number one, two, three, four, five. And then automatically separate it. I think the time involved in in doing that, it just it just intuitively is you got to have a better cool. system than that. You got to get to like an automated system with a conveyor belt, and you know, they they developed a robotic arm that does all the work. You know, picks it up and scans it, and then throws it in the right bin. Um, there's many. I mean, like say one floats animal, and the other one doesn't, getting, so you skim yeah. off the one that floats. You know what I mean? something massive that kind of is going to be able to separate them in a, in a process. Yeah, as far as automating this, this is a, this is actually, it's not very advanced to, to do this. Um, I mean, I, I worked at, hang up and I worked at uh, Ford as a quality uh, manager or engineer there. And uh, I also worked at a um, bottled water facility as a plant manager where, you know, everything was automated. Um, so right. the, the systems exist, they're like basically on the shelf uh, units that you can buy and put together and create an entire line that will uh, essentially go through all the plastics. And then there's always going to be a degree of, um, you know, mistakes, but those, oh, yeah. usually those anomalies, when it can't scan it for some reason, you have somebody there to pick it up and yeah. figure out what to do with it and make a, a human decision on it. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that just comes down to money. If you put together a plan, I don't know, either, so far, I and, haven't heard. And float it out there, you know, once you have it packaged and you know, we're, uh, and I guess you need to start with, um, like known quantities. Do, do we know how much plastic that we, we put in landfills, what, how much waste we have as far as how many pounds of plastic, do we have estimations on that? Any kind of I, quantities? I don't from the county, but I do know that worldwide it's 800 million tons of plastic okay. into, the, into the into the earth or the ocean, either or. I mean, it's okay. Uh, so if we know how many how many pounds uh, roughly, then we can get a good idea of, of what kind of scale this facility needs to be, or facilities maybe uh, two, one for the west side, one for the east side. Uh, and uh, in, in dealing with our, with our waste and then design it based around that with a capacity to, uh, you know, to, to take on maybe 30% more over the next 10 years or whatever the projections are, you know, building right. in, you know, some capacity because you're not gonna be running at 100% capacity all the time, first of all. Second of all, you have to have downtime for maintenance of the machines, et cetera. Um, but my, right. my other question um, is yeah. regarding, um, the, the specifications on these uh, plastic um, components, like the, the uh, plastic lumber, et cetera, um, is there, are there specs for um, uh, its hardness, tensile strength, uh, compression strength, et cetera? I mean, do we, do we have those? Uh, uh, there is, I don't have like, I don't have like a, uh, like a you know like a study or anything like that really easy i know that they've done breaking tests on like plastic two by fours and they're like 20 times harder than a wood one um something like that it's it's like super hard um but you know th those are the questions that you know we'd have to address before you know you'd try to sell something like commercially other you know like a board or something um so and those uh, other hurdles with going you know 
going with the federal, you know, the federal laws about, you know, what is, what is a board? What is a two by four? You know, those are like federal standards, you know, um, that we, you know, it's stay away from to... structural building materials. That's right. way down the road. Yeah. Um, make two by fours. It's like now they make the plastic wood for decking for our porch decks and stuff like that. It's not a structural yeah. thing that it works, you know? Yeah. That, uh, that yeah I would gonna... stay away. I, I tried to go down the road of using alternate uh, building materials a few years ago, and I learned the hard way what's uh, right, right. There, I know with the tracks that plastic, you know, decking, there has been a brainstormed idea that we make it here in Hawaii with high bore uh, sawdust instead of just regular pine sawdust like the tracks, because the tracks is uh, termites will eat that here in Hawaii. Really? <laughs> yeah. Bugs. They'll eat the wood. They eat the wood out of the plastic, and then you know that that trex is already kind of flimsy as it is. It even becomes even more flimsier. Wow, that's good to know. So there's, you know, I understand there's lots of lots of hurdles, but you know, I think with the pavers is an entry level easy win. Um, you know, small scale. You know that yeah. like we could cottage industry. You know this here until we get a bigger building that you know you can make a thousand at a time or a machine or some kind of automated way or something. You know. Um, Again, I would work on proving the concept first that you can do it at scale. You yeah. got a, quite a ways to go to get there before you. you know, get so, yourself. David, if I understand you just from um, everything you've said in in our conversation, also uh, before the the meeting started. Um, it sounds like your three biggest current hurdles for uh, proceeding as you are small scale is um, your ability to process. So your, um, your mulcher, you need a, like an industrial mulcher or a shredder. Uh, yeah. You also uh, need to finish building your oven um, and maybe need to upscale or look at upscaling to, to an additional oven or additional ovens, plural. And then the, the third thing would be uh, in, in collections, um, which you said you have talked to a property owner already in downtown Hilo who has a, a facility that would, would accept. Okay, um, but it's just a matter of, of staffing it and, and manning it, is that correct? That is correct. And where, where is that location right now? Uh, it's down on Kiali Street, down towards uh, the end, towards downtown, uh, you know, Bayfront side. Okay. And um, uh, I checked it out, and it's like a big warehouse, and it does have, uh, you know, driveway in the back access, you know, where somebody, you could have people come in and turn around and, and you know, exit. Okay. And would you, um, do you think if we did collections there two days a week, that would be sufficient? Uh, that's probably more than I would, I would even ask for. I, I, I would just do once a month, probably, once like month. we're doing now. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, just because it's a, a staffing people, you know, volunteer issue, you know, and uh that's that's just how we've operated it, you know, once a month on all our collections. And so, you know, yeah. Okay, that's good to know. In uh, your collections, uh, do you typically do just for a few hours or? Uh, two hours. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, the flow is people come in the car and, and get their stuff out. Usually they either have it in their own container, whether a bag or a bin. And uh, they just you, they come, and then we have trash cans or bins set up with the numbers, and you just throw your stuff in each bin and take off. Sounds good. Um, like a, I know like I was talking with uh, Charlene, like a, who's a, a powerhouse member for our club, and uh, she says that she thinks there's a good possibility we could. Uh, you know, look into, at least look into grants and, and get a grant for something uh, like this and then make those paid positions. Um, I think right now with the, uh, the political climate uh, that we are in uh, and the fact that, you know, trash is, is so important to us uh, here on this island, 
-hmm. I had a um, an engineer come and stay with me who was overseeing the capping of the landfill here in Hilo. And he was shocked because this is the first place he's ever been where everyone cared about trash. It was on everybody's mind. And, uh, you know, he thought that was really cool. And uh, I think you'll find um, it should be pretty easy, at least as uh, paving the way to get things done. I think people want to see solutions, uh, you know. So I think that my biggest concern is something that uh, Alan had brought up earlier is, you know, the microplastics in the ocean. Um, I wish uh, uh, my girlfriend were in the room right now. She um, just gave me some statistics. She worked for the California Coastal Commission. So, uh, and um, just gave me a, a statistic about uh, how, much, uh, how much plastic is in the oceans currently and that it's expected or projected to triple uh, by like 2065. And yeah, I mean, that, the, yeah, that's just, that can't be, it, the way it is right now is just terrifying. And the, the right. idea that it's, it's projected to triple in, mm -hmm. in, in that period of time is, is unacceptable, is what it is. And, uh, right. it's you know, it's, it's going to take a unified global effort to, to deal with that. Um, but we definitely, uh, you know, there's, we could talk about that forever. But um, my biggest concern is that as we make more plastic products, um, <clears throat> we're increasing the, the likelihood that plastic waste is going to enter, um, you know, our, our water sources. And um, so public education, as far as like constructing, when you're constructing pavers, nobody's cutting those up. They're putting them, you know, setting them down. And I, I, I like that idea. Um, but like lumber, anytime you're cutting with it, you need a, a vacuum collection system. And, you know, not all vacuum collection systems are made equal. So some of them really suck and they, or they don't suck. And they, uh, you know, you're just sending these microplastics and you're creating a vast amount of microplastics and just sending them everywhere. Um, so that, that's one thing that I would like to make sure is uh, addressed, you know, um, should you move forward with that. And uh, I would, you know, I know um, Kat is passionate about this. Keith, who was on earlier, is also very passionate about this. And, um, you know, I would definitely uh, like to talk more about um, opportunities for, for volunteering. Uh, if you need members of the board, um, you know, let's talk more about that as far as what kind of time commitment is is involved. But I'm pretty sure uh, I could I can definitely uh, you know serve on the board myself. Um, right. And uh, you know, we can talk more about um, about what volunteering positions are open and, and needed to be filled in the future because it's definitely right. uh, in line with with uh, with our values. Right. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about, you know, microplastics, and they're just, just discovering more and more about microplastics. Um, they're actually in the air right now, and we're breathing them. You just don't know it. They're in, in every living creature on Earth right now. They're, um, right. One of, uh, one of Leah's friends, uh, my girlfriend, um, created a way to test birds just by swabbing the back of their necks. And can tell right. how much plastic is in their system and right. she since she created this she has yet to find a bird that doesn't have plastic in its system mm -hmm. and you know right. we now know that microplastics are, are found all over the world so right. it's 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 it, in everything and, and well, as it increases me, it's you know right let me let me tell you this because you know it's kind of weird because i've studied this a lot i mean hours you know this is kind of like my my passion the thing with microplastics and you know, people talk about them, but they're not really understanding. They're not educating people. Your clothes are shedding like ounces of microplastics. Every right. every shirt, every shirt, every time you dry it, it's filling the air full of microplastics. They don't tell you that, but then you know, we, we talk about microplastics in the ocean. You know, that's like two different things. And you know, your the the dryer lint obviously leads to in the ocean as well, but uh, so I think there's so much science that that you know still needs to be done. Who knows what that 
stuff does to you when you breathe it, you know. When you wear a polyester yeah. shirt, you know, you're shedding those everywhere in the air. So I you know, I, I, I think there's gonna be a lot of a lot of science coming out because that's that's one of the big things they're just talking about right now is why you don't see all the plastic in the ocean is because it's under the water. And they're actually finding in a lot of these, like the deep water trenches are filled like a landfill full of plastic where, you know, it just kind of floats down to the lowest, you know, dip or whatever in the ocean. And uh, I think I think that we're gonna discover a lot of things about plastic that we didn't know, you know before. Um, you know, it's just, it's stopping like the ghost map. You know, I, I had an idea of actually there's, uh, a, a boat right now and it just landed in Honolulu last week and it is powered entirely from plastic that they harvest from the ocean using that machine that I showed you. Um, they they turn the plastic back into oil to power the ship. Yeah. Wait, so is that um, is that energy positive then? I mean you can create from the gas you can create enough heat to create more gas I, I would say I, it's a dirty thing because you're, in my mind, you're burning oil, you're releasing carbon into the air, but the reality is it's already here because it's in the form of plastic. But you're changing it into oil, which might actually kill you versus this plastic bottle, you know, in the environment. So there's kind of like a, I don't know, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. What they do on this boat is they go out and they get those 50 ton ghost nets and they pull them out grind them up and, and turn them back into oil. Or they come and drop them off here at the harbor, then they take them to the landfill. You know, that just takes up space in the landfill too. So I don't know, there's lots of lots of aspects to, to all these things. Yeah, definitely. It's a good you know, what, um, what, what my comment on this is, I kind of disagree with uh, uh, David on this is that I, th I think we know a lot about plastic. In fact, we, we, we know more about plastic than a lot of different materials that we use. Uh, the problem is we don't know how to recycle it, how to reuse it. That's the problem. Because right. if you come up with a good application, or maybe a 10 different applications for that, you're going to have companies lined up to right. try <laughs> find a way of solving this thing. I mean, you know, providing all that material and processes and machinery and everything like that. So right. what we got to spend all our energy on is coming up with what do we do with it? You know, it, right. like my idea of uh, meshing it up and making it into, put it into a 3D printer and print up homes. I, I think it's, you know, you don't have to worry about mixing plastic. You can mix everything you want in there and maybe throw in some uh, gravel and lava, <laughs> lava granules and everything like that. But the point is, there's a great need for affordable homes. And if we can solve this uh, using plastics, that might be one of the solutions. So we really need to find what we're gonna do with it. Uh, that's the thing. You know, when, when I was working for the phone company, we used to collect phone books and uh, every year. And a little kid came up to me and said, what do, you, what do they do with these phone books? And I didn't know the answer. You know, we're throwing this into this huge bin, tons and tons of phone books, and I didn't know what they were going to do with it. So I went to research that thing. We were shipping it all the way to China and Thailand or someplace, and they were made into uh, eight cartons, and then they ship it back to us. And I thought, wow, why can't we do that here? You know, what makes it so difficult that we cannot make eight cartons uh, here? But you know, and of course, somebody explained to me the economics and uh, everything like that. Yeah, and that was it. You know, that got me think. I thought about that when you answered me, you know, my question about 95% of the plastic we send to China is not really recycled. I, I have a hard time with that. I'm going to research that a little bit more that a country would import plastic and dump 95% for social reasons. I mean, you know, to have a, have a nicer relationship with America. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think the Chinese are a lot smarter than us on that kind of stuff. So, you know, they, they've been working a, uh, for a long, long time on, uh, on social uh, relationship. So I, I have a hard time with that. There, there's a video I posted in the group about the Malaysia 
plastic problem. Um, you should watch that because they, um, it's, a, it's crazy because they have like huge districts that's just one ton bags, as far as you can see, full of like unrecycled plastic, you know, that they just don't because somebody didn't, couldn't recycle it it's because it was contaminated. It's a, it's a big problem. Uh, one idea that I have that, or had that we should do in Hawaii that they're doing over in Sacramento is uh, using the pet bottles to pave the roads with. Uh, what they do is they melt the plastic down, put your aggregate in it, and coat the aggregate with the, the plastic, and then they coat the plastic in asphalt, and they put that down, and supposedly it lasts like 10 times longer. Um, you know, it's I like guess what I was saying. Is to you know, incorporate seen. these things. Right. And so they're already doing it in other places. So that's why I say we could do it here. If somebody's already figured it out, we can figure it out. Yeah, our problem is really compounded because besides the plastics that's already out there in the ocean and the landfills and everything like that, mm -hmm. there's this constant wave of plastic entering our uh, environment. You know, people are using it. You know, at this very moment, uh, every day, I know I'm, you know, there, there isn't a second that goes by that I don't touch plastic in my house. So I know how, how much uh, I'm part of the wave. I, I create plastic waste and I think we all do that. So if we want to stem this thing, we, we need to change the mindset of people that not to use as much plastic. Uh, how do we do? We're not going to be able to stop this. It's going to keep on going. Right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate everyone their questions and comments, you know, uh, this, this problem is bigger than just me, you know, and I, and I, I appreciate everyone's thoughts because I can't think of everything myself. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for I, joining us, Dave. Yeah. Could I just say one thing? Uh, thank you. And also, uh, I wanted to know, oh, I was hoping, as has uh, Dave, have you talked to the East Hawaii Small Business Development Center? They're uh, also very helpful. Yeah, and we're, I have talked to them and we're, we're in works of, one of the ideas we had since we're kind of a new nonprofit was kind of um, what they call nesting under another nonprofit. And so that might be one of the ways we go so we can then use them um, to get grants. Um, it's like I said, it's very complicated and that's even that is kind of complicated too because basically if we nest under another nonprofit, then they get full control over the funding and everything. So, and, and, and I've already approached one nonprofit here and, you know, it's kind of a liability thing too. So there's kind of that. And so, you know, it's not not quite as easy as everyone thinks it is. It's very challenging, it's very hard. Um, but yes, I, 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 I am going to work with them and I have okay. talked to them a little bit. Good, I, they have helped me a lot. They're, yes, right. they're very good. Yeah, thank I you. agree. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. And um, let's stay in touch. Um, I'd like to talk more, like I said, about volunteer op uh, opportunities. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you so much for, for your time today. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, yeah, we have Debbie Ono on, uh, prospective member. I would have introduced you uh, in, in the beginning of the meeting, but uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. And, uh, and Alan Okanaka, uh, thank you for, for joining us again. And uh, please join us. Uh, we have uh, great speakers lined up for the next uh, three weeks uh, and, and more to come. So stay tuned. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Aloha. Bye. Everybody. Aloha.